Welcome to Climate Change, a Veterinary Problem. Go ahead and share my screen. Uh, now, before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on beer pie country, and we at VFCA, Veterinarians for Climate Action, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. As we hope in this webinar to move toward a more sustainable future for all, we can be inspired by the strength, resilience, and capacity of Aboriginal people, by their long history on this land and the care they gave to this land for thousands of years. My name is Angela Frimberger. I'm a veterinary oncologist and volunteer climate advocate educator, and I'm a founding member of Veterinarians for Climate Action. Now, this image is called the iconic blue marble image. It was first taken in 1972, and this was the first time that people had seen the whole earth at one time. And the loveliness of this image is the way it shows the complete circle of the planet, helping to conceptualize the connectedness of all the Earth systems. In this presentation today, we're going to have a few interactive items using Mentimeter. This is not at all required, so if you can't participate for technical reasons, it's no problem. But if you can jump in, it's just fun. Uh, for anyone not familiar with it, it's pretty easy. You will need a separate tab open to the one that you're watching the presentation on and navigate to menti.com then type in code 18445991. Uh, we'll, you'll have one minute to respond to each poll question. So we're gonna go over to there and start with a quick warm-up question to get the hang of the system. So the first question is, where does your favorite terrestrial animal come from? And if you have a tab at menti.com, type in code 18445991 and you can go ahead and spend one minute voting on where your ter favorite terrestrial animal comes from. Woohoo! Nice start. So what's fun about this is that as people enter their responses, we can see them pop up live. Everybody's keeping it close to home, hey? Was that you, Luana? Africa. <laughs> North America, thank you. Okay, so this is how the system works. We'll head back over to the presentation now and we'll come back to Menti a little in a few minutes. Although we face many important problems in today's complex world, I personally put the bulk of my efforts into climate change because climate change affects every other issue. The earth is literally the foundation on which we stand. And if we lose that, nothing else really matters. Climate change touches on everything we care about. We all love our families. And if we have children, we want their futures to be bright. We care about our communities. We want our friends and neighbors to be safe and healthy, our town to thrive. We want our businesses to be successful in a healthy economy. As citizens and human beings, we care about immigration and defense, and we recognize moral and humanitarian problems. And as animal health professionals, we worry about the loss of biodiversity, climate change as a health threat, and particularly about the impact on animals. Although I was worried about the environment for many years and felt that as an educated person in a wealthy country, I ought to be doing something somehow to try to make things better, I just didn't know what or how. Seven years ago, I attended a three-day training sponsored and presented by the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Climate Reality Project, which is founded and driven by former Vice President Al Gore. The other 409 attendees and I were taught the science behind why climate change is occurring, 
what's happening now and what can be potentially expected under different possible scenarios, and importantly, what can be done to improve the situation. At this stage, we're gonna duck back over to Menti for a little pretest. We're gonna do two questions now, and then we're gonna repeat the same two questions at the end of the presentation and see if our answers have changed. So the first question here that we're going to do is about knowledge. And then the second one is about feelings. So the first question is at the baseline, how knowledgeable do you feel about climate change now? Have you, have you got a little cheat sheet there and you can take verbal contributions? <laughs> sure. Uh, so you can put me down for reasonably. <laughs> I'm having trouble. I'm trying to get up the Mentimeter on my iPhone. It's not sort of working. It might be too much for uh, for the iPhone. I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, it's it's meant to be able to work on the phone, but especially one that's only got iOS seven. Okay. Um, so this is a pretty usual profile um, to what um, I usually get for this question, although I have to say that in this um, audience, I'm getting more varies than I usually get. Uh, there's usually only one vary in the group, um, but it's about the same profile as what we usually see. Now, the second question is actually much more difficult, and this one is about feelings about climate change. So in this one, I would like you to please type in three words that describe your feelings about the subject of climate change. I feel frustrated and angry a lot too. Um, you got your pencil a, ready? This is a very, very difficult thing to talk about and think about. I, I can give you inevitable, harmful and silent. Thank you. I feel pretty much all of these feelings at one time or another. Um, thank you guys for that. So we're gonna go back over to the presentation again now. So as an oncologist, oncologists have to be optimistic by nature. <laughs> so since I've started doing climate advocacy work, I've found that talking about climate change is a lot like talking with a client about their pet's cancer. I'm afraid I have some bad news. I know this is upsetting, but we do have some options to help control the condition, and they're not as bad as you may think. So in this presentation, I'm first going to give you a brief overview of climate science, then we'll talk about the impacts on animals. This can get a little overwhelming, and honestly, this is meant to be humorous, but the truth is that if you love animals like I do, not all of this talk is going to feel good. Um, but I promise you that we will shift gears and we will finish with a positive outlook and a focus on how we can work together to improve the situation. Now, climate change is a complex problem that stems from increased heat energy trapped in the Earth's atmosphere. This obviously leads to increased temperatures, which is a problem in itself, but the situation and its consequences are more complex than simply warmer weather, and we'll discuss this. Before we go too far into the discussion, I think it's helpful to go over some of the terminology surrounding the topic. Weather is the atmospheric conditions over a short period of time, and climate is the background condition to weather. How the weather, how the atmosphere behaves over relatively long periods. I live in a Mediterranean climate. Today, the weather is partly cloudy. Now the terms global warming and climate change are sometimes used interchangeably, but strictly they refer to slightly different things. For our purposes of conversation, certainly we can use them interchangeably, but I wanna clarify this point because sometimes people think that the difference in terminology means that we don't really know what's going on, which is not the case. 
Global warming refers specifically to the Earth's rising surface temperature, while climate change includes warming and other effects of increased energy in the system, like melting glaciers, heavier rainstorms, or more frequent drought. Although the Earth has warmed and cooled before, and the climate has changed before, the terms global warming and climate change in general use now usually mean the specific human-caused or anthropogenic phenomenon that we're talking about today. It's also important to be clear right up front that the science on the main points surrounding climate change is settled. It's not a question of belief. The bottom line facts of climate science have been in place for decades now. And in 2016, the Bulletin of Science, Technology and Society reported that the consensus on AGW or anthropogenic global warming among publishing scientists is verging on unanimity. Like any science, knowledge is still growing and there's much still to learn, but the remaining questions about the science of climate change are not whether or not it is real, happening now, serious, important, or urgent. If anything, empirically observed changes now are outstripping predictions, not the other way around. Globally, 19 of the 20 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been since 2001, and the other one was 1998. The five hottest years of all have been the last five years, and 2020 was a tie. Surface temperatures have risen significantly globally, but how can this be true when we can walk outdoors on some days and our senses tell us it's cooler than we expected? It's a matter of likelihoods. Now, can you see my pointer at this time? Yep, great. Uh, so every day, the temperature is either average, cooler than average, or warmer than average. What has happened is that compared to weather records in the past, we do still have cooler than average days, just fewer of them. And we have more days that are warmer than average and more days that are hot. These next few slides illustrate this. So this first slide shows the global summer temperature distribution during the three decades, 1951 to 1980. You can see a nice bell-shaped normal distribution curve, and this serves as the baseline. Here, we see the temperature distribution in the 1980s compared to the baseline set in the preceding three decades. And as you can see, the bell-shaped curve is still there, but it's just shifted over to the right, and we're starting to see occasional extremely hot days. This shows the temperature distribution in the 1990s compared to the same baseline. You can see the curve continues to shift further to the right, and in the first decade of this century, we see the, see the curve shifting even further to the right with more warmer than average days now than previously average days and extremely hot days becoming increasingly common. Although we do still see cooler than average days, and this is why occasional cooler than expected weather does not disprove the science of climate change. Why is this happening? As you know, it's caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And while carbon dioxide or CO2 is certainly not the only culprit, it is a major player. CO2 is now commonly referred to as carbon, although chemically what we're talking about, of course, is not the element carbon, but rather the compound carbon dioxide. But a planet is really big, so how can human activity possibly significantly change it? I find this image taken from the International Space Station illustrative on this. This is essentially a cross section of our atmosphere. This is the surface of the Earth with the sun shining through the troposphere and the stratosphere. The lowest layer of our atmosphere where the weather takes place is the troposphere. When I look at it this way, this is actually much thinner than I usually think of it from down here. To consider it another way, if you were to drive straight up in your car at normal highway speeds, you would reach the top of the troposphere in a little over 10 minutes. In less than an hour, you'd be for all ordinary purposes in space. That makes it much easier for me to grasp the idea that our atmosphere is smaller than we tend to think of it, and that human activity can actually significantly influence its composition. So why do these greenhouse gases heat the Earth up? We know that much of the heat in the atmosphere comes from solar radiation and warms us, which is a good thing. Some of the energy reflects off the surface of the Earth, and the Earth itself produces infrared heat energy. And some of that reflected and produced energy is trapped by gases in the atmosphere that are partially opaque to infrared, forming a cozy blanket. Now, if we increase the amount of these infrared blocking components or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, 
by, for example, emitting CO2 faster than it's absorbed by natural processes like plant growth, then we have a thicker blanket and we'll have more trapping of heat energy within the atmosphere. And it goes from a good thing with an ideal temperature to a bad thing where we're seeing a net increase of heat energy in the system. And that is what's happening now. 30 odd years ago, I took an oath to use my scientific knowledge and skills for the protection of animal health and welfare, the prevention and relief of animal suffering, and the promotion of public health. Climate change clearly poses a threat to animal health and welfare, as well as to public health, and it causes animal suffering. So to me, it's a no-brainer that veterinarians have a duty to act on climate change. The veterinary impacts of climate change are manifold, and we'll focus in on a few of these a little bit later, although obviously a full treatment is way outside the scope of our time together. There's an obvious risk of suffering to wild animal species whose habitat is changing faster or farther than the species can adjust with it, or that is exposed to flood or fire. Climate change is not a cause of either flood or fire, but the severity of both types of events is increased by climate change. So we're seeing more frequent severe events. Just a few examples from our iconic native Australian species. Koalas and platypus are both vulnerable to heat stress and neither animal can extend its range significantly on an individual level. Koalas also lose out because hot weather reduces the nutritional quality of eucalyptus leaves. And when they travel in search of better food choices or relief from hot weather, they become vulnerable to predators and car trauma. There's also a risk of over it suffering to both pet domestic animals and production animals in heat waves, flood and fires. It's estimated that 3 billion wild vertebrates were killed or displaced, plus another 60 to 100,000 sheep and cattle killed in Australia's bushfires last summer. There are also less dramatic and immediate threats to animal health and welfare, and these overlap with threats to public health. For the most part, these center on infectious disease and food security. The World Health Organization predicts changes in infectious disease transmission patterns as a likely major consequence of climate change. It's already been shown that the productivity and nutritional quality of several major food crops, including corn and wheat, is reduced by heat stress. And food plants are also vulnerable to increased, to increased pets, pests and diseases. Finally, Climate change related events such as severe storms, floods, and bushfires result in substantial economic losses to individuals and communities. A healthy and well-maintained pet population depends on a reasonably prosperous society. So in the face of economic stress, the pet population risks losing out. And when financial stress drives families to cut costs associated with caring for their pets, the economic viability of veterinary medicine for pet animals as a prestigious profession is also at risk. Now we're gonna zoom in for just a few minutes on just one of these, coral bleaching. So where does all this extra heat energy go? 90% of it goes into the ocean. This graph shows the increase in temperature in global oceans over the last eight decades. And specifically in the Australia region. In the last few years, Australia has seen a wildlife disaster unfolding in slow motion with repeated severe coral bleaching events hitting the Great Barrier Reef as just one example. For anyone who doesn't know, the total area of the world's coral reefs is just 0.2% of the entire marine environment. But although coral reefs are small, they're huge in diversity, being home to up to 2 million species or 25% of marine life, and they're nurseries for about one in every four fish in the sea. Cold water reefs are highly susceptible to acidification, while tropical reefs are severely damaged by rising sea temperatures. The Great Barrier Reef is the biggest natural feature of any kind on Earth, Live visible from space. It's the biggest tropical marine reserve with biodiversity on par with that of a tropical rainforest. And it protects many species, including dugong, dugongs and six of the world's seven species of marine turtles. Coral is an animal related to jellyfish and sea anemones. The thing we usually think of as a coral is actually a colony rather than a single organism. These colonies are composed of many genetically identical but individual animals known as polyps. They're radially symmetrical, like a tiny sea anemone with tentacles. Some corals can capture some food, but most corals rely on symbiotic algae called zoosanthellae, which undergo photosynthesis and coincidentally give corals their spectacular color. 
Now, when corals are extremely stressed, the zooxanthellae are expelled, resulting in the phenomenon of bleaching. This is not death, it's severe stress, and corals can recover if conditions improve and the zooxanthellae return in time. But if conditions don't improve, then the corals will starve and die. This is a coral called Great Star because it has relatively large polyps and a close-up of the polyps with the tentacles clearly visible. They're quite beautiful. And here's a close-up of familiar staghorn coral where you can also see the individual polyps. And these guys are adorable, aren't they? Now, there are many threats to the health of the reef and I could go on and on, but the take home point for today is that most coral biologists consider climate change to be the single most pressing danger to the reef. This is because the biggest direct impact on tropical corals bleaching, is directly linked to increased temperatures. Bleaching has been observed on the Great Barrier Reef since 1982, with multiple severe bleaching events associated with underwater heat waves since 1998, and the three most severe being 2016, 2017, and last summer. Water temperature changes of more than one to two degrees can kill some species of coral, and a temperature rise of two to three degrees would be expected to put 97% of the Great Barrier Reef in danger of annual bleaching. As said, the bleaching events in the last few years have been the worst ever recorded. But as we said, corals may recover from bleaching. So what happened in the long term? In June 2016, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority released the follow-up mortality data from the 2016 bleaching, showing that in the northern sections of the reef, the areas otherwise most pristine, mortality was as high as 50%. Even that would still be recoverable if it were an isolated incident, but it's not hard to see that 50% mortality year after year is not a good long-term prospect. Now, you will hear some people say that you can't attribute any specific event to global warming. You just have to say the odds have increased, but attribution science is growing quickly. And now we can say that every storm is different. All storms are different because of the huge amount of energy added to the system, the huge amount of water vapor. Remember the water cycle? As we remember from primary school, this diagram teaches us that the overall amount of water in the Earth's system is fairly stable. A proportion of it is locked away as ice, and the rest of it moves around by evaporation. For to increase the energy in the system, it pumps up the whole cycle, as well as adding more liquid water to the system by unlocking free previously frozen water that wasn't cycling. So increased evaporation leads to increased droughts, but also to increased water vapor in the atmosphere so that when it does rain, it rains bigger. Extreme precipitation events have increased and produced more rain and become more common since the 1950s in many regions around the world, leading to these apocalyptic looking storms colloquially called rain bombs, less colloquially called microbursts or supercell storms. In fact, rain bombs are four times more common globally now than they were in 1980. The February 2019 flooding in Queensland resulted in a $1.7 billion loss to the Australian economy. A year's worth of rain in one week and half a million cattle killed. In my local area, just last month, we experienced one in a hundred year flooding causing massive losses to many businesses and families and horrific losses of livestock and horses in river valleys up and down our coast. With numerous farms reporting loss of entire herds swept away in floodwaters. So this is a drone shot of a farm just up the mountain from where I live. And these things are cattle. People living down at the mouth of the river were finding animals that had washed down the river. And we had people down on the beach rescuing cattle from the surf that had managed to survive their trip down the river and been washed right out to sea. It's hard to imagine what these animals experienced. We now have a local Facebook page for horse and livestock post flood lost and found. Sadly, of course, there were some animals that didn't survive or haven't been found. Sometimes people wonder how global warming can be blamed for causing more precipitation and flooding and at the same time, more drought. 
The extra heat that's being trapped actually leads to both. And as the climate changes, precipitation patterns also change, leaving some places with less rainfall than before and long established relatively predictable annual patterns starting to deteriorate and becoming less predictable. And this is, makes things very, very difficult for farmers. Now, as hard as it is at first to imagine that drought and floods could be caused by the same problem, it's even harder initially to make the leap from flood to fire. But we know that when fires occur, their severity depends on the preceding weather conditions. So when we have hotter, drier conditions, fires that occur will be more severe and harder to control. Here's a screenshot from my phone about a year and a half ago. This is my watch zone here. And this was my backyard on that day and afterwards. Climate change threatens not only the health and welfare of individual animals, but along with other factors such as ecosystem loss is contributing to the most severe extinction event since the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Led by this modest looking little guy, the bramble key melamies, or mosaic tailed rat. Uh, he's declared extinct, last seen sometime between 2015 and 2019 considered the first extinction of a mammal species specifically due to anthropogenic climate change. Its habitat was inundated by rising sea levels. Now, there are people who don't value nature inherently. I don't think most of them are on this call, um, but they're out there. Even those people need to recognize that humans are part of an ecosystem and we will not go very far without a functioning biosphere. And climate change is a major threat to human health too. Infectious diseases, heat stress, air pollution, waterborne diseases, food security, they're all influenced by a change in climate. We tend to think of heat as a discomfort rather than a killer, but that's not really accurate. And in fact, many more people died from the heat in the weeks leading up to the Black Saturday bushfires than died in the fire themselves. The people most vulnerable to this are the elderly, the very young, the poor and homeless, and of course, people in developing countries are disproportionately affected. Warmer temperatures have an impact on the spread of tropical diseases. Air travel plays a part, but potential range for many diseases expands as regions farther and farther poleward get warmer. So there are more and more places where tropical diseases can take root. And the main mosquito that spreads Zika dengue and yellow fever is now covering a wider range in a warmer world. In warmer temperatures, mosquitoes breed faster and are able to transmit the disease for longer. Now, some wealthier people in developed countries are not that worried about this. What about cost, we say? Economic losses from extreme weather tot totaled $653 billion over the past two years alone. People sometimes worry about the economic impact of action to mitigate climate change, but it is less than the cost of climate change itself. Let's consider just sea level rise for a moment. Miami is the number one city at risk in terms of assets at risk, along with Guangzhou, China, New York, Newark, and others. Now, if we change how we measure the size of a city from assets to population, we see that many huge cities in developing countries are very much in danger. If parts of these cities become uninhabitable, where will the people who live there go? The left-wing alarmists at the US Department of Defense have long warned about refugee crises connected to climate change, as well as pandemic diseases, water shortages, and food shortages. So from perspectives of biodiversity, human and animal health, intergenerational and international justice, economy and infrastructure, immigration and defense, and humanitarianism and morality. Guys, we need to do something about this. Now, as I promised, I have a lot of good news for you too. Once we know where the problem is coming from, we can start to address it very specifically. As I said earlier, CO2 is a major greenhouse gas, but it's not the only one, and others include methane and even water vapor. So in that case, why all the fuss about CO2? Well, the reasons are that it contributes a major proportion to warming, 
It's the main greenhouse gas produced by human activity, and also because it's the greenhouse gas most likely to be controllable with reasonable regulations and laws. And while there are other sources of CO2, the biggest by far is the production and burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels still provide more than 80% of the world's energy, but I'll show you soon, it doesn't have to stay that way going forward. Their use and emissions has gone up dramatically since World War II. And here are the fossil fuel emissions by source in Australia, and most other countries have fairly similar profile. Electricity is the biggest one. Second biggest is mining, industry, and heating, and then transportation. Agriculture is there as a major player, and we'll come back and talk about that. But it's much, much smaller than the other sectors. So there's much that can be done about this, and the technology we need is within reach either already existing and feasible or feasible and well on its way. Now there are two main categories of response, adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation, now often also called resilience, means accepting some change and learning how to manage it. And mitigation means taking steps to limit the amount of change that will occur. I focus more on mitigation rather than on adaptation because Adaptation generally centers around the needs of humans and it doesn't solve the problem for other species. But the truth is that we do need both because we are already committed to some change. So right now, the outcome we're striving for is to limit warming to two degrees or preferably 1.5 degrees. Now, 1.5 degrees doesn't sound like a lot, but as a global average, that is quite a lot of energy. And remember that 1.5 degrees makes the difference between ice and water or between you feeling well or in bed with a fever. Now this gives rise to the idea of a carbon budget based on scientific estimates of how much more CO2 can probably be emitted without exceeding this threshold. Another term you may have heard is drawdown. And this is where we move from just stopping making it worse and start making it actually better, literally drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, mitigation efforts in the past have focused on individuals and businesses minimizing their personal carbon footprint, switching off lights, using recycled paper products, and more. And that's important, and it should continue. But individual efforts are not enough in the face of industrial scale extraction and emissions. The big push there has to come from government, industry, and finance, and it is starting to happen. Now, this is a global problem, and so the United Nations process, the UNFCCC, is key. Last December, the UN's Climate Ambition Summit resulted in a call for individual countries to declare climate emergency and take more urgent action. President Biden's climate summit is another example of progress that's helping to raise the bar. Another key is money. The finance sector is progressing really quickly, recognizing the economic risks of climate change and old technologies. Many scientific and financial experts now agree that doing nothing about climate change is already becoming more costly than doing something, and that moreover, a change will be win-win. The equation is no longer the environment versus the economy. It's now the economy and the environment both on the same side versus old thinking. We're starting to hear leading figures in business saying things like, if we act on climate change, we'll have more productivity, better health, and the world will be altogether better. Acting on it brings us all kinds of good things, jobs, livelihoods, and profits. Many financial institutions have announced they're not going to finance this anymore. And the RE100 initiative has partnered with 230 major global corporations committed to source 100% of their global electricity from renewable sources. The Powering Past Coal Alliance is an alliance of national and subnational governments, businesses, and organizations committed to accelerating the transition from coal to clean energy, whose 97 members currently include more than 30 countries and 27 subnational governments. And here's another important solution, reforestation. By removing CO2 through photosynthesis, forests function as terrestrial carbon sinks. This is drawdown. At any time, forests account for as much as double the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. As one example, the 1T.org project aims to unite and accelerate reforestation initiatives around the world 
by creating an online support platform for the reforestation community that will help mobilize funds, leverage political support, and connect stakeholders. Now, agriculture. Agriculture, admittedly, is a big greenhouse gas emitter after fossil fuel use. We remember that pie chart that we looked at a few slides ago. But agriculture is also on the front lines of climate impacts. And agriculture is also a potential hero of this story by being one of the most practical sources of CO2 drawdown. The agricultural industry and farmers are working hard on this and they deserve all the support we can give. Agriculture's role in climate change, climate resilience, and mitigation is a huge topic and really it needs a whole webinar to itself. But for today, just briefly, it's a system of farming principles and practices that seek to rehabilitate and enhance the entire ecosystem of the farm by placing a premium on soil health with attention to water management, fertilizer use, and more. That results in greater carbon sequestration in the soil as well as being more productive and less polluting in other ways. Excuse me one second. But as we said before, the biggest emitter is fossil fuel-based energy production. So here's an example of progress in energy production. Back in 2000, the best projections for wind energy were that we could reach 30 gigawatts worldwide by 2010. That projection has now been beaten 22 times over. When we look at the amount of wind energy being built around the world, we see an exponential curve because the cost has come down so quickly. Wind energy could supply 40 times more electricity than the entire world currently uses. Some people don't like the appearance of the turbines. I personally think they look futuristic and beautiful, but not everyone agrees. But I don't think anyone could argue that a coal mine is prettier. Same story is unfolding for solar. Back in 2002, the best projections said we could install one gigawatt of solar electricity by 2010. When 2010 rolled around, we beat that goal by 17 times over. And then by 2019, we beat it by 121 times over. Even more dramatically than with wind, we see an exponential curve in the amount of solar energy installed around the world. Electricity from wind and solar are now cheaper than electricity from new coal plants or new natural gas plants. And here's a co-benefit for developing countries. Renewables can be less centralized. So in many areas affected by energy poverty, it's actually lack of grid access, not lack of coal, that's the problem. And now in areas where there's no universal electricity grid, consumers and businesses can leapfrog over old technologies to install small scale renewables in places that have long been denied access to electricity. Every hour, the earth gets as much energy from the sun as we need to run the whole global economy for a year. So if we can just increase the fraction of that that we harvest and use, we can make a lot of progress towards solving the climate crisis and helping local economies at the same time. So we can definitely meet this challenge. The solutions are at hand. We only need to decide to implement them. This is not to say that it won't take some resolution, care, and attention to justice and transitions, but it is to say that it's not a hardware problem. Responsible transition should not become a euphemism for kicking the can down the road because we will, we will run out of road. So what can we do? There are three things everyone can do. Use your choice, your vote, and your voice. We all know ways to reduce our personal impact and it's valuable to do the best we each personally can. Next, we need to think about where we spend our money. Every time we make a purchase, we're giving things a little push one way or the other. So we need to think about these choices, whether we're getting our weekly groceries or choosing our superannuation or the default, superannu default superannuation for our businesses. Each choice we make can be a force for positive change. There are lots of information resources available to help us make climate friendly financial decisions. Then, while we all need to tread as lightly as we can and put our money where our mouths are, we also need to elect policymakers who will work for the public interest. Although climate change isn't an inherently political issue, 
it is strongly affected by legislation. So if we think climate change is important, we need to understand what our candidates' positions are on these matters and vote accordingly. And then we need to continue to work with our elected representatives to help them make good decisions. Lastly, we need to be able to talk about climate change and its impacts and stop avoiding the topic as if it's somehow impolite. And we need to not only privately do the right thing, but allow ourselves to be seen doing the right thing, normalize it. Now, the best part, what can veterinarians, the veterinary profession do? Well, it turns out that there's a lot happening on climate in the veterinary profession. I'm gonna share some resources with you today, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. And I'm sure some of you might know about resources and groups that I don't, in which case I'd be very grateful if you share those with me afterwards or pop them in the chat. Now, the medical profession has seen the connection between climate change and their professional duty and been more active on climate, but we're getting there and we have a big contribution to make. We're trusted members of our communities and we're good at conveying scientific information to lay people. As opinion leaders in our communities and advocates for our animal patients, we can use our scientific knowledge and skills to lead by example, educate those around us and elevate the public discourse for the benefit of all. Because members of the veterinary profession are respected members of the community and opinion leaders, one of the biggest things that each of us can do is to not run away from those cocktail party, barbecue, kids soccer game conversations about climate change. This does not have to be divisive as many fear it will. Climate change has become politicized, but as I said before, it's not an inherently political issue. It's just science information and that we can do. So I hope that what you've learned here is enough to make you feel confident in those conversations. You don't have to be a climate scientist. We all trust and rely on scientific consensus every day without being primary experts in the fields. Lots of people who aren't aviation engineers get on planes. Nobody disputes your opinion on vaccination if you haven't done a PhD in immunology. We can and need to trust the scientific consensus on climate change too. When I got involved in climate advocacy, I started thinking about where I could make a difference. It was easy to find places in my local community where I could pitch in, but I also wanted to work on climate change within the veterinary profession. There was an organization called Doctors for the Environment, but there was no similar organization for veterinarians. The good people who had run the Alliance of Veterinarians for the Environment for years had gotten busy with other environmental projects. Climate Vets was started in 2016 with the hope of one day contributing policy submissions and perhaps things like letters to the editor and the general media. And Climate Vets has about 50 members in the US and Australia, but it was always short of time and not very well resourced. So it was a struggle to pull together the advocacy work originally hoped for. Now, about a year and a half ago, I was contacted by Jeanette Kessels, who was very concerned about climate change and had been inspired by Farmers for Climate Action and wanted to start an Australian organization for veterinarians. So Veterinarians for Climate Action was founded in late 2019. Our mission is to inspire the veterinary profession to advocate for and achieve climate action within and beyond our profession to help ensure a sustainable future for all. As a few examples of VFCA's work so far, we contributed to the Bushfires Royal Commission and the Emergency Leaders for Climate Action Bushfire and Climate Processes over the past year. Here is a full page advertisement in the Saturday Australian that shows our logo, logo right here with all these other wonderful environmental organizations. We've developed a good working relationship and a memorandum of understanding with the AVA and in response, the AVA has formed a climate action working group that's working towards updating and strengthening the AVA's climate policy. A group of former chief veterinary officers, some of them here today, wrote an open letter to the prime minister to discuss climate policy. Last month, three of us joined 30 delegates from other health organizations under the umbrella of the Climate and Health Alliance and spent a day meeting with federal lawmakers explaining the connection between climate change and health impacts and the importance and urgency of the problem. 
The Climate Smart program will be a 12 month program to help veterinary practices become sustainable in their own work. And VFCA's webinar series has produced some excellent recordings. In addition to the Climate Action Working Group, the AVA included two hour workshops on both sustainable agriculture and climate change in the past few months in, the summer, in their summer series, and will include more climate related topics in all of their centennial conferences this year, as well as a climate focused short series that's going to be taking place in VetFest just next month. In the UK, Vet Sustain is a fantastic organization to help veterinary professionals be a leading force for sustainability. There are a couple of good Facebook groups for animal health professionals looking to be more involved in sustainability. There is Veterinarians Concerned About Climate Science Denial that's administered by Katrin Swindells. I'm not sure if Katrin's here today, um, but she's very active and wonderful. The Sustainable Vet Nurse and Sustainability Advocacy in Veterinary Education or SAVE. Now the group behind SAVE, which is led by the One Health Club and Colleen Duncan at Colorado State University, is in the process of publishing a series of papers on attitudes about climate change in the veterinary profession. The first, published online in August last year in the Journal of Veterinary Medical Education, reports the results of a survey of over 900 veterinary students and finds that the respondents were overwhelmingly confident that climate change is happening due to human activities and is impacting both human and animal health. They're very clever. Veterinary students also expressed the belief that veterinarians should take a leadership role on the issue of climate change, especially through promoting environmental sustainability in clinical practice. The second study, Impress in Frontiers in Veterinary Science, surveyed over 600 veterinarians and found that overall, respondents were confident that climate change is happening, is caused by human activities, and is impacting human and animal health. Veterinarians also agreed that the profession should have an advocacy role in educating the public on climate change and its health impacts, particularly in clinical practices where environmental sustainability promotion can be shared with clients. The third study, also in Press and Frontiers, surveyed over a thousand pet owners and found that the majority believe that climate change is occurring and two thirds would value knowing that their veterinarian received training on the animal health impacts of climate change. More than half would pay more for veterinary services at a clinic with a reduced environmental impact and clients would value some form of sustainability certification to aid in the identification of such practices. Lastly, this group held a major event just this past weekend and VFC's own Jeremy Watson was a contributor to this event and recordings of this event should be available in the coming weeks. And a few months ago, the World Veterinary Association released a position statement on what it describes as the global climate change emergency. Now we're gonna head back over to Menti and over to you with some ideas on what we can do. So this is a fill in the blanks. What can we as veterinarians or the veterinary profession do about climate change? Nice. Going straight to the politicians. Changing public opinion. Join Vets for Climate Action talk about it. Yeah. Nice. So in our day in Canberra last month, uh, every politician that we met with, we uh, asked them, what can we do to help you be active on climate change? And they, every single one of them said, keep educating the public. What you're doing is good work and it's helping. So they felt that the more educated that their voters were on climate change, the more likely they were to be able to make a useful impact. Sustainability in the clinic, walk the talk, lead the discussion, educate, fantastic. That's awesome, you guys, thank you. 
There's so much happening and I'm so excited that we're building more and more connections to act on this most important of all problems. So the last two Menti questions is gonna be a repeat of the first two questions. And we're gonna see if things have changed at all. So the first is again, how knowledgeable do you feel about climate change now? Wow, that's really lovely. That's a that's a big increase in knowledge level. So that's that's really really wonderful to see. And then the second question is about feelings. Three words that describe your feelings about the subject of climate change now. It's still a problem. We haven't made the problem go away, but we're hoping that we can be more hopeful, determined, nice. That is really, really beautiful to see. Thank you very, very much. Still frustrated, still worried. Absolutely, so am I. But the more hopeful and determined and motivated we are, the more likely we are to be able to actually limit climate change and help the animals that rely on us. So, Please join an organization or a Facebook page if you haven't already. Keep in touch. It can be very challenging to be active on climate change, but your colleagues are here to support you. It's much better working within a group and working with support from your colleagues. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, we can take any questions if anyone would like to. Angela, do you mind if I uh, jump in just quickly? It's, oh, okay covered up my screen my video it's Karina here uh, I'm, I actually I'm going to hand over to James to um, facilitate Q&A but just before I do that uh, firstly uh, just two quick things enormous thanks for a presentation that was sobering uplifting and motivating <laughs> there are a number of things that I wanted to highlight for me personally um, uh, just quickly but I won't do it for time reasons but one thing I will say is I'd like to create a talking points document. Lots of things really help us to, in, in all of those advocacy and education conversations that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just fun. These, the points that you've raised are just excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to just say to the group here and to ask you to pass on to others that this has been, this is going to be a wonderful um, uh, talk in combination with our next webinar uh, because that's, I mean, you mentioned at the start, the word cloud that you, uh, that was formed at the start showed that we were frustrated and angry. They were the dominant words. Um, and then at the word cloud at the end said we were determined and motivated, but we were still frustrated and angry and sad. Uh, and our next presentation is going to be, uh, is going to address exactly that. So in, as we hit this, what many people are calling this critical decade of change, the decade that we really, really need to act, uh, everything's starting to sink in, and that includes the emotional impact. And uh, in the webinar series so far, we've presented a lot of fa facts, a lot of really important information. And next time we're going to um, address the emotional toll that this is uh, potentially taking. And particularly in a, a profession and a, a community of animal carers where mental health and burnout and emotional toll of what we do is already quite high. So um, we're going to take a, a really different approach to the next talk. It's going to be with uh, uh, a, uh, sorry, veterinarian turned journalist, Jonica Newby, Dr. Jonica Newby. And she's going to join 
me for an in, in conversation style uh, presentation. So I'll be I'll be putting questions to Jonica and uh, she'll be talking us through the book that she's just written about uh, called Beyond Climate Grief. And it's it's a story. There'll be she promises there'll be there's some laughter and tears and uh, food for the soul, but also science. So she spoke to a number of psychiatrists, psychologists, and evolutionary biologists. So it's a really fascinating combination of um, people that she talked to, and um, as well as talking us through her journey of what what was the emotional trigger that really changed. Uh, things for her to start really acting. Um, as well as that, she's going to talk to us, like Angela has done, about specific strategies, about um, healthy information diets, about uh, an algorithm for um, remaining strong, you know, uh, real practical strategies for how to uh, rise to the challenge that Angela has um, has put forward to educate and ad advocate without succumbing to despair and uh, frustration. So uh, the other thing that's going to be a little bit different about that webinar is that it's going to be in the evening. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to reach veterinary students around Australia. We've got extremely strong support from Murdoch University already. Um, the, the student groups around the Australian universities are really uh, active and humbling and motivating. And we also would like to reach out to practicing veterinarians and you know, sometimes it can be difficult to find time during the day. So if you could put in your diaries 7 p.m. on the 25th, Tuesday the 25th of May, that's 7 p.m. On the, in the Eastern States of Australia uh, for that In Conversation with Jonica Newby.